Energy 808, the cutting edge. This is ThinkTech. I'm Jay Fidel, and we have on the line Marco Mangelsdorf of Brobridge and Solar in Hilo um, to talk about energy today, the cutting edge, not only in Hawaii, but maybe in the country and in the world, because Marco follows it in many, many places. Welcome to the show, Marco. Well, in difficult times that uh, we live in, my friend Jay, it's uh, it's good to be back with uh, my brother Jay Fidel here in the in the trenches as we seek to uh, make sense out of the unsensible sometimes. Well, I'm glad you're back in the in the U.S. of A. and uh, I'm glad you're back in Hawaii, and I'm glad you're back on the Big Island, which doesn't have all that many cases. And um, and I'm glad you're not no longer in Asia because that that was risky and. It, even more written is getting back. <laughs> you manage to have your have your cake and eat it too. So uh, it takes courage to travel these days. Well, I remember my my beloved aunt Linda, who uh, gosh, she was quite the person. She had a PhD in clinical psychology. She lived down in Waipio Valley and then Hamakua Coast for over 20 years and had many wise things to say over the years. One of the things she um, told me was that she believed that so much of life is his timing is based on timing and I returned from Southeast Asia about a month ago and I reflect pretty frequently that if my schedule had been such that I was trying to return two weeks ago or three weeks ago or let alone one week ago I could be one of those still somewhere over 20,000 Americans somewhere overseas trying hard to get back home uh, during these difficult times so whether it was my lucky stars or my karma or the good Lord, uh, one and all, you know, I'm, I'm very appreciative to be back and not effectively stuck somewhere in uh, Laos or Vietnam or Cambodia or, or Singapore or who knows where. Yeah, but that's one of those things that um, maybe the press and, the, and this particularly uh, the TV media, they don't, they don't cover that. Uh, maybe they can't cover it because they don't have the access to it. But there are hundreds of thousands of Americans who are stranded over, overseas who would like to get back. I mean, you wouldn't want to be in a developing country as and when, I guess, when a coronavirus hits that country because they don't have any uh, health care infrastructure and you're in much, much worse shape. Um, the other thing that I think that the press doesn't cover enough is the international aspect of the crisis. I mean, hundred and 70, 80, 90 countries in the world are infected already, and it's it's going pretty fast in some of them. Some of them, and um, and it's a flat world, so that uh, whatever happens there is going to affect us. In uh, 1918, with the Spanish flu, uh, it was uh, it, it, surf it surfaced. The patient zero was in the Midwest here in the U.S. and uh, in the war. Uh, First World War, troops carried the, the virus to uh, Europe, where it got really bad. And when they came back, they brought it back with them. So there were two waves of virus. And we can never forget that, that virus these days uh, doesn't care about borders. And um, there are many countries that have it. And if we don't watch out, if we don't help them, if they don't somehow deal with it, it's going to come right back to us even if we solve it within within the country here. And I don't think the press really makes enough of that. There was a guy on, uh, I guess it was MSNBC the other day who pointed that out, uh, Ian Bremer. Uh, I mentioned that to you, and uh, Bremer was completely aware and, and telling us in very pointed terms that that was the case, and we better watch out. We better be aware of the international phenomenon here, and we better try to help countries all over the world. And unfortunately, they we're not doing that. So we're just asking for it to come back. Uh, so that's a great concern. So Marco, you know, you've been following this on an economics and business basis. Um, why don't you tell us how it's effect affecting the national economy? And uh, although I, I don't necessarily, uh, you know, feel that the national economy and the stock market are synced, are synchronized, um, maybe you can tell us about the stock markets too. Mm -hmm. Well, there are kind of four levels of analysis that I, I can take, Jay. Uh, first is, uh, you know, kind of what's going on in the American economy writ large when you look at various indices such as the Dow Jones Industrial Average and the Standards and Poor. 
average and NASDAQ and so forth. And then the next level would be what is the electric utility industry? What's the utility sector? How is that faring, comparatively speaking? And then next level would be what's going on in our very own state, kind of on the, the state level as far as energy. And then finally, the fourth level is what's going on in the solar industry here in, in the state. And of course, that's near and dear to my heart because I'm a business owner of a solar contracting firm. So. I think one of the things that I found interesting is that as the Dow Jones has reduced uh, in value substantially over the past weeks, you know, oftentimes the utility, the electric utility or utility sector writ large uh, fares better in a storm, is seen as somewhat of a safe haven in terms of investors going to the utility, excuse me, the utility sector when other sectors of the economy are in trouble. And according to the data, and if you look at uh, the Dow Jones Industrial Average uh, ending last Friday, several days ago, granted it went up again today, as it'll go up and down, up and down, as is its way. Uh, but the Dow Jones was down 28% uh, last Friday compared to its peak uh, the, in, in February. Uh, the utility average, the Dow Jones Utilities Average, which is a, is a conglomeration of, of many kind of major utility companies and stocks, that went down 26%. So uh, you see that the safe haven in a storm notion of, of the utility sector uh, doesn't hold true, really. Yes, it's a couple of percentage points better than the Dow Jones Industrial Average, but at the same time, it's taken a substantial hit. You know, one of the observations can be made that the uh, utility stocks were overvalued uh, to begin with. There had been rating kind of a uh, Kind of in one of those um, uh, investor bubbles, and in that it was due for a correction. So again, I guess kind of the big takeaway for me is that there are uh, there, there's carnage across so much of the economy, including the electric utility sector, uh, that varies anywhere from certain companies being down, let's say, 20 percent, to others like PG&E and AES Corporation, which are down 40 to 50 or more percent. So, and there's a whole bunch of companies kind of in between. So. I guess, again, the takeaway here, Jay, is that the utility sector is getting hammered just about as hard as, as the rest of the economy writ large. Well, let's let's talk about the utility uh, group, if you will. I mean, first, the first thought that comes to my mind is that, that the health of the economy in many ways is linked to the health of the utility. In other words, uh, if I'm able to generate a lot of electric power, it means, it means that the utility is healthy and, in fact, it helps build the economy. Uh, you know, a good economy requires uh, good electrical power, and, and good electrical power helps build a good economy. There's is, is a linkage there somewhere. And, and the other thing is, uh, I don't know if these uh, declines in stock price mean, uh, mean that the utilities are not healthy um, in terms of their operational aspect, but I imagine, I'm taking a guess here, I'd like your thought on it. I imagine that if, if a lot of businesses are closed, um, and if a lot of people don't have money to pay the electric bill, then the revenue to the uh, the revenue to the utility is going to be less. So when you look at return on investment, you look on revenue, you look on the ability of the utility to a you know pay its own bills and b uh, raise 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 debt funding to carry it over. Both of those are impacted, and therefore uh, an analyst in Wall Street would say, oh. Utilities, uh, you know, are not a good bet these days. Tell me your analysis about that. Well, uh, I think you did a good job, Jay, and I would just add to it that, uh, you know, there's at least a double, if not a triple whammy, that uh, utilities are facing across the country. Uh, as you mentioned, the prospects for lower uh, kilowatt hour, megawatt hour sales, I think, are quite evident as uh, industries close down the energy uh, they would otherwise consume as they were humming, if they were humming at full capacity. The energy they're consuming uh, goes down significantly as factories are, are shut down or factories are or grateful, greatly, greatly reduced in terms of their, their output. So that means less power is being sold, therefore less money is coming in on a regular basis into the coffers of utility companies. And uh, the second whammy is that as business owners and consumers are faced with a cash crunch of their own, 
they have to make uh, critical decisions in terms of the available cash they do have. What are they going to do with it? They can't pay everything that they would otherwise pay if the cash flow is normal, right? They have to pay for food. They have to pay for to, for essential services, and uh, asking themselves, well, you know, if I'm gonna, uh, if I have the choice between uh, getting food for my family or paying my rent versus paying an electric bill, maybe the electric bill is going to uh, take a lower priority, and therefore the default of people paying their bills on time to utility companies, I think, is uh, inevitably going up and will stay up for a time. And then the third whammy is you have utilities who typically aren't all that cash rich in terms of having a big war chest of available cash to be able to spend uh, in a discretionary matter. So if they don't have that type of cash sitting in the bank to be able to tide them through difficult times, then they have to tap into their credit lines, which uh, is effective of, you know, it's essentially a loan and they have to pay it back. And credit lines are not infinite, right? And it usually never are infinite. So it's uh, it's a difficult time for for utilities, just like it is for so many other. Well, what about what about the uh, bailout that Congress that Congress the two trillion dollar bailout that Congress uh, enacted? I mean, I, right now, up to this point, I would say that that bailout was aspirational, because the uh, the bureaucracy and it's a sad it's a sad time to to have this surface. The bureaucracy is unable to cut the checks. And um, it, it's also troubling that the Trump administration, uh, with the airlines, which are you know a big object of the bailout, uh, the Trump administration would like to get stock uh, from the airline companies. So at the end of the day, uh, they are owners, or at least part owners of the airline companies. The airline companies are not happy with that. They're not going to agree so easily on that. But it seems to me that any large capital concentration is in the line of fire. Uh, on the administration's attempts uh, to get stock in their company. I would, if I were any large company, I'd be concerned about that, and I would certainly not want that to happen as an observer either, because that sounds like uh, what happened in Germany in the 30s. Uh, that sounds like what happened in fascism, uh, where the government owns the uh, large the large companies. In any event, um, you know, that's, that's been great trouble. So what happened to the bailout? You know, people aren't getting checks yet. I don't know uh, if uh, Mnuchin is actually giving money um, to large companies. There's a bit of a squabble about the oversight. Everybody's worried about Trump kind of redirecting to his friends or his own companies. Um, and uh, so the, the bailout's not happening yet, even though it's it's a month after they started working on it. Um, what about a bailout for the utilities? Are the utilities the object of, uh, of that bailout? Are, are they supposed to get money? And when? And how much money? And how much will it help them? Well, that's a great question, Shane. And I have to admit that uh, I haven't had the wherewithal to take as deep a dive into this uh, massive piece of legislation uh, as I probably should. I've been much more kind of selfishly focused on how it would affect my company. And what I can speak to is that the so-called uh, payroll protection uh, payroll protection program. What is it called again? I want to make sure I get it right. Payroll pay, payroll protection program, or PPP for short, which just has been rolling out in the past several days, is designed for small companies. Small being defined as 500 or less. So mostly, most utilities obviously are, and you know, the bigger ones are going to be more than 500 employees. The, but the payroll protection program is, from what I can tell, essentially quasi-free money uh, with certain limits, obviously, and certain specifications to allow small businesses like mine and others to be able to pay two months' worth of payroll uh, that is essentially funded by the government in an effort to keep small businesses solvent. And I think I shared a piece with you from the Washington Post yesterday that there was a survey of uh, small businesses by one of the, the, the groups in Washington and the estimate was that without emergency financial support, 50 or more percent of small businesses will be at risk of closing their doors within the next two months. And when I read stuff like that, obviously it gets my attention because I'm a small business owner as well. So you know, to answer your question, I believe I was speaking to my bankers as well. 
at First Hawaiian, as just I'm sure Banco is speaking to their customers, Central Pacific Bank and so forth, and American Savings Bank, is that they're, you know, all the banks in Hawaii are keenly focused and have uh, adequate, hopefully adequate staff who have taken the deep dive and who, who are submitting applications to the SBA, the Small Business Administration, as you and I are speaking right now. So, you know, that, that program, the PPP program, will undoubtedly become oversubscribed within a matter of days. And now apparently there's talk in Washington and, and the president is on board as well with this. Hopefully uh, that, that program, the PPP program, would be uh, more finances, more money would be added to it if, if this current pot of hundreds of billions of dollars is tapped out relatively soon, which I think seems pretty much inevitable. So. Uh, have yes. checks started flowing from the SBA yet? No. Do I believe and hope that it's possible that companies like mine could be receiving them in the next two, three, or four weeks? Yes, I think that is possible, and I'm, I'm hopeful that that will be the case. <clears throat> yeah, but it might not be. And every time you see an article about projections on when those funds are going to be actually distributed, it's, it's more than three or four weeks, sorry to say. And, that's, and that takes me to my next question. What's the time dynamic on this? You know, we don't know when we're going to reach the apex. Nobody knows. And everybody likes to say, oh, it's flattening out. That's what Cuomo said today. It's flattening out. Really? Uh, I, don't, I don't know if that makes me feel better. I, I like to see it go down the other side. I'd like to see it reduce visibly. Uh, and, I, and I don't know about business. So all that apex business, is that's, that's really about cases and deaths. Um, but, but about the, you know, the... The mom and pop businesses, the small and medium businesses, and for that matter, the big ones, um, time is is eroding them, and you know, fragmenting them, uh, and making it more and more and more difficult for them to come back online. And we don't talk about the apex there, so it's very hard to say when this economy is going to come back, um, and furthermore, when it comes back, as and when it comes back. Uh, what it's going to look like, uh, who's going to be left standing, and who's not going to be left standing, and what we do in order to achieve the same level of economic activity. So do you have any thoughts about that? And I ask everybody this question. I'm sorry, I want to ask you too. When is it going to come back, Marco? Well, as I think I mentioned to you in our, in our prelude to getting online or getting on the air, Jay, uh, to me that's kind of akin to the question of, of a, a hospital discharge planner coming into the room of uh, somebody in the ICU, the intensive care unit, with a bright face and a cheery smile saying, how are you doing, Mr. or Mrs. So-and-so? Uh, the plan is to have you discharged by tomorrow or, or thereabouts while you are in the process of fighting for your very life. So I, I kind of resist a little bit uh, going too much into the forecast business as far as, far as you know where we're going to be, when we're going to be after the apex. I mean. Our esteemed lieutenant governor was quoted as saying the past 24 hours that he's expecting maybe by the end of this month or early May, Caldwell, Kirk Caldwell, mayor of uh, Honolulu, saying the same thing. So, But like you said, we won't know where we, we've hit the apex until we're on the downside. And you, you alluded to this earlier as well with the 2018-2019 pandemic, if I understand correctly, it first hit at the beginning of the year, went down during the mid time of the year, and came back with a, a double or triple vengeance in the fall. So, you know, it's it's it, it's difficult to prognosticate. I mean, it's one of these. To me, I've come up with a metaphor of we're all on this monster wave because, of course, lots of people are into surfing here in the ocean, which is important. Uh, uh, we're surfing this monster, turbulent, scary wave, and we don't know how long it's going to take for us to take it for it to take us to the shore, but I'm absolutely convinced it will take us to the shore and we will get over this and at the same time, uh, lots of suffering in the meantime and those businesses that survive, uh, because many businesses will survive, many will not, will be ones I believe who are relatively uh, light in terms of debt, who aren't heavy leveraged, heavily leveraged, who have been able to squirrel away some in terms of reserves to be able to make it through difficult times, but you know, that piece I sent you a while ago from the Wall Street Journal a week or so ago, you know, notes that uh, most businesses, most small businesses have about the same liquidity that most homes do or most uh, families, which is all of a week or two, you know, two or three. It's 
Yeah, yeah it's not in government fund for the mom and pops. <laughs> Sorry, what so about the mom and pops? Another, another hard question. Not quite as hard, though, I have to say. Is, let's assume we're at the end of the tunnel and the light is there and that there's a sign of, uh, you know, the uh, beyond the apex, the, the cases are falling, um, you know, the shops are permitted to operate, people are permitted to, you know, come out of their homes. So I know it's not going to be right away, but whenever that happens, what what is the sound, what is the process of an economy coming back together again. What's the first thing and what's the last thing? And what are all the, you know, the processes in the middle where the economy begins to return to normal? Do you have a feeling about that? Well, I mean, the, the first thing that comes to mind is that uh, people are more comfortable spending money uh, rather than hunkering down and spending it only on, on uh, essential items. So. There will be upticks uh, on, on the graph in terms of people spending more money because they feel that the storm has passed. They feel more secure about their their present and their future, and they start spending more. Uh, I mean, I think that's that's one of the key indicators. And you know, I've I've been around this state long enough, like you have, to know that whether you're a, a Democratic uh, Democrat governor or Republican governor, like Linda Lingle, I mean, every governor going back to statehood probably has said something along the lines of the state has to do more to diversify away from being so heavily dependent on tourism because we rise and fall with the, the 1 million, 2 million, 10 million tourists who come to the state. So, you know, maybe, and I'm not the only one observing this, I read a piece from Henry Curtis uh, earlier this morning as well that maybe this presents an opportunity here in our state to uh, really take some, some substantive steps away from being so heavily dependent on tourism and have a more diversified economy, which means, of course, many things to many people. But you know, I, I choose to look at it positively that in times of great stress and crises, there are also opportunities to be had because the, the, the opposite of just doom and gloom and the sky is falling and, and heeding the words of Cassandra that you know, we're, we're all uh, in for it uh, is a place uh, you know I, I can't afford to allow myself to go, so uh, we make the choice to, to see opportunities in, in, in crises. And the, the reality is the state is still heavily dependent upon imported fuel to the tune of 80 plus percent, uh, despite decades of efforts. And you know, we, we all have to do more, and my business has to do more, Hawaiian Electric has to do more, KIUC has to do more, we all have to do more to reduce our dependence on these long supply lines of fossil fuels, which is doing so much damage to our, our one and only planet. So I, I choose to see that there's still so much work to be done, so much good things to accomplish to, to help our state and help, all, help, our, help our islands to be greater, more resilient, more robust, more energy, food, um, self-sufficient. You know, I'm, we've been talking about those things for 20 years, actually 30 or 40 years. Um, and, and there's three of them, I think. Uh, one, uh, as you say, we have to get off uh, fossil fuel and get onto renewable, be more self-reliant. Two, in the same vein as agriculture, we have to be more self-reliant in agriculture. And three, of course, as you mentioned, as we all know, we can't have a mono economy built around such a fragile thing as tourism, as we see again. Uh, we saw it in 9-11, now we see it again. Um, I'm sorry, you know, these are serious problems. We've been talking about them. Lots of uh, people in public office have talked about them all these years, and there's a great risk that when we get through this, somebody develops a vaccine. That's my opinion, by the way. It won't be over until there's a vaccine invented, you know, discovered, and also deployed worldwide. That's when it'll be over. I hope that's soon. Uh, but, you know, after it's over, there's a fair chance we'll go back to exactly the same conversation without action. So, you know, I, I hope this is going to be the, you know, be the, the, the message that changes things, but I'm not optimistic about it because complacency is much easier from a political point of view, uh, you, you know, not to have to change anything. We, we really haven't changed anything. We've let, we've let these factors, you know, work no matter what the conversation was, and here we are completely exposed. Um, what, are you optimistic or pessimistic about that? These, those three issues have to be resolved. Who is going to do it? Is this serious enough to send a message? I think we need 
a number of champions, whether it's uh, who follows uh, Governor David Ige, whether it's Josh Green or somebody else. I think we need uh, elected leaders who truly feel that fire, that passion, uh, and champion these particular uh, sets of, of priorities. I think uh, uh, that's a sine qua non uh, for making real progress. And yeah, I mean, necessity, the mother of, uh, of uh, innovation, uh, right? And there is uh, there's a, a greater necessity than now than ever before. But in terms of optimistic, pessimistic, I guess it's kind of easy to fall back into the, yeah, we'll go back to, to our complacent uh, selves, uh, you know, after this crisis passes, but somehow, somehow, you know, it, it has the feeling that there's this, to me, on a, on a broader kind of uh, philosophical, spiritual scale, maybe something of a cleansing going on. I mean, there's so many ways where we, as Homo sapiens, our species, is uh, been fouling our nest to such a, a such an atrocious degree that uh, I would like to believe that sometime. Sometimes Mother Nature, Mother Nature, and and uh, and Mother Earth, uh, you know, remind us that we are a part of nature as opposed to being apart from nature. And I don't think there's any question that we, each of us, are going through an experience, you know, in, in fear and um, self-examination that will change us going forward. And we come out of this vaccine or otherwise. Um, however many of us do come out of it, um, we'll be different as people. A lot of us will be different as people, maybe all of us will be different as people. And, and our economy, our society will be different, whether we like it or not, it'll be different. It could be that, uh, you know, everybody leaves to go to the mainland. Uh, who knows what? It could be that we try to do the same things we were doing before and not change anything, and the state simply fails. Um, you know, it's hard to collect tax money if there's no business. Uh, but finally, I, I wanted to ask you about the energy industry, uh, especially, uh, you know, the installers of solar on, on single family uh, homes, uh, on condos, on community solar. You know, we, we had a pretty good head of steam going a few years ago, even until recently. And now uh, I'd like to know from you how it's doing and how you think it's going to be changed uh, in, in this pipeline. Well, there is, uh, I'll answer that this way, Jay, there was a letter that was submitted to the Public Utilities Commission by what I'll call the solar parties, the solar energy parties, just on Friday, kind of addressing some of these particular issues uh, as part of the Distributed Energy Resources, or DER docket. And I'll just read you a little bit of, um, of what that particular letter, uh, quote, our initial surveys indicate that many Hawaii solar companies have furloughed or laid off significant numbers of their employees. Nationally, the Solar Energy Industries Association estimates a nearly 55% decline in new business for the residential sector alone. So they're making the, the pitch essentially that uh, Hawaiian Electric, in this case, needs to uh, loosen up in terms of the various requirements that uh, they have established that have been approved by the commission over time uh, to allow uh, rooftop solar essentially be below 25 kilowatts in size to go in faster and become operational faster. So that's something that the commission will be taking up in the days and weeks to, to come. But what about I mean, you know what about the legislature? The legislature, which is completely non-funk now because they decided uh, that the building wasn't safe and they were all going to do a recess, an indefinite recess. The legislature, you know, could take affirmative action. Uh, to uh, move the, uh, the credits, uh, to somehow incentivize. That's what legislatures are for, to decide what industries should be supported and incentivized and, and what not. But they're not doing anything. Uh, they won't do, in my, my opinion, they won't do anything until next year at the earliest, next January. So um, aren't we missing a huge opportunity to tweak not only energy, but other critical industries in the state uh, by doing incentives, uh, tax holidays, uh, filing dates, mm -hmm. uh, tax credits, deductions, what have you. Uh, you know, to me, that is a very obvious 
um, a very obvious help to the industry, but it, there's no prospect of it. Not a single, not a single one percent prospect. What do you think about that? Oh gosh, I, I wish I could make a strong case and dispute what you're saying, Jay. But I mean, they seem to be. I, I read that they're holding this hearing or that hearing, maybe virtually or using proper social distancing. But I mean, there are a total of, if I'm not mistaken, 76 total legislators in Hawaii uh, on the state level, 25 senators, 51 House reps. And while we hear frequent stuff from likes of Mitch McConnell on the Senate or Chuck Schumer or Nancy Pelosi uh, taking up various calls for action in Washington, uh, it seems to be kind of missing in action in our own legislature as far as where's the big, bold, dramatic thinking. Uh, uh, so yeah, I, I can't say I feel terribly uh, emboldened or encouraged or supported by any type of progressive or, or helpful hand coming from uh, our state government these days. Yeah, you know, the thing about it is that they, they have the power of the purse. And the most uh, significant aspect of that is is tax changes, tax tweaks, tax credits, and, and so forth. That's how you change business conduct. That's how you change the way an industry is doing. And if industry isn't doing very well, it's it's obvious the legislature has the power to fix that. So uh, I'm, I'm just sad that, A, uh, they really haven't uh, followed through on, on the targeted, uh, what is it, 45%, but rather 100% uh, by 2045, or or 100% by 2040, they haven't really, um, you know, provided the, what do you want to call it, infrastructure to let that happen and to build it the way it should be built. They've kind of let, take, taken their hands off the stick in recent years, and now there is no stick. So that's kind of sad. Anyway, I, I wanted, you know, I wanted to, to ask you, you know, what, how should we be feeling about all of this, Marco? I, you know, I, I believe we're in phase two of our psychological progression. The first was, it was, it was interesting to talk on Zoom, and you make phone calls to all your friends, um, and you learn to live in a quarantine type, you know, uh, stay at home mode. And I think, uh, you know, after a while, it's going to settle in on people. This isn't so great, and the things are unraveling, um, and they really have to dig deep to find the personal strength, and for that matter, the business strength. Uh, to resume when the time is right. Uh, how do you feel the community is doing uh, on, on business, on, on personal, and if you like, on energy? Oh, man, if we had another three or four hours, I think we still wouldn't really cover things, but we don't have that much time, so I'll give you my quick uh, synopsis. I mean, here in the Big Island, where I've been living now for, for going on 20 years, you know, we, uh, I, I think we seem to be doing okay you know we have 22 known cases seven of which have been uh, released from isolation not a single hospitalization let alone death here on this island so you know there's the desire of course of everybody who lives here to to keep it that way and the fact that we have less density of course than oahu or parts of maui i mean is is tends to our our favor. So, you know, from my perch on the Big Island, uh, uh, this is where I definitely would like to be anywhere in the in the world, practically, uh, to to be able to ride this out. So, um, I don't know. I I just have to be focused day to day, week to week, doing the best decisions I can for my own health and safety, for those people I care about, for my employees, and at the same time, uh, fully know which I do and and really feel that life does go on is going on beyond COVID-19. And uh, there's a lot of a uh, lot of good things yet to be done together. So that's uh, that's what I'll leave you with. OK, and I'll leave you with a, a story that I saw in 60 Minutes about a, a young fellow. He couldn't have been uh, too much more than 30 in Brooklyn who had a uh, an event, a decoration business. So they make uh, exhibits and and design features for events and conferences and conventions. Um, and he had achieved some success, but now he's out of business because there's no events. So what does he do? He's got all this uh, plastic equipment. Uh, he's, got the, he's got the inventory of plastic, and he's got, he's got the cutting tools to cut it. 
he decides he's going to start making those masks that you wear in hospitals, the ones that we're so short of. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's plastic and it's outside your regular breathing mask. It's so that nothing splashes in your eyes, those masks, okay? And he, and he finds he can do them. And, and he finds that there's a huge market for them and he can sell them. So he, t he brings his staff back and they start doing this innovative design and selling all over New York City. Um, then he says, my goodness, this is bigger than I thought. So he, he, he triples his staff, and all they're doing right now is working on these plastic masks. But I say to myself, you know, there really is an opportunity for innovation. I mean, it's not everywhere, it's not every time, it's not every business. But, um, you know, for the innovative entrepreneur, um, this is the time to think about the guy in Brooklyn. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We need your stories like that. Yeah. Thank you very much, Marco. As always, I look forward to our discussions, and I look forward to the next one. Hopefully, um, hopefully it won't be too dramatic, but um, if you listen to Washington, it might be. Thank well, you. So I'll, I'll just close with uh, there's this, uh, this surgeon, apparently, in New York who started being uh, putting out uh, uh, his thoughts sometime mid-March, and he's become somewhat of a, a poet celebrity now. And I've read a little bit of his stuff. I don't remember his name, but you know, working in the trenches there in New York City, and he he, he uses the uh, we need to mush on, mush on as in the sled dogs. We just need to continue to mush on, and that's what we will do. So thank you for being there with me. Thank you, Marco. Aloha, Bye -bye. and stay safe. You too.